Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all so much for joining us for today's program. My name is Melissa Loriano, and I serve as the Programs Associate for the DC Preservation League. Um, for those of you who may be new to DCPL, our organization has been dedicated to preserving and protecting the historic built environment of Washington, DC since uh, 1971. So before we officially get started, I just wanted to share a few brief technical notes about how today's program is going to work. So please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions of the presenter. I will collect your questions and verbally ask them of our presenter at a few points during and at the conclusion of the presentation. If we do not get to all of your questions, you can email us at info at dcpreservation.org and we can pass them along to our speaker. For those of you joining us on Facebook, uh, my colleague Jessica Unger, our Outreach and Grants Manager, will be monitoring any questions that you all might have and pass those along to me as well. With that, I am so pleased to introduce you all to today's speaker. Christopher Brown is a native of New Hampshire who has spent several periods of his life in DC. He moved to the district as a child in 1954, then lived here again in the 60s and the 70s, moving here permanently in 1981. He currently lives in the Foxhall Village Palisades area. Chris has degrees in anthropology, uh, elementary school teaching, and forestry. He fell in love with canoeing 50 years ago while teaching school in Chicago. Since then, on vacations and through jobs in river conservation with American Rivers, the National Park Service, and the U.S. Forest Service, he has paddled in all 50 states. Wow. Um, its unique history and riverfront location drew him to the Washington Canoe Club in 1990. He is an honorary life member of the club and a member of DCPL, whose collections and family albums largely provided the assemblage of images in this book. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Chris. Great, thank you so much, Melissa, and uh, welcome to everybody to this talk. I, I really appreciate uh, uh, DC Preservation League uh, for hosting this and uh, the Historic Society of Washington, DC, uh, Ann McDonough was also very helpful. And I must say that when I got started on this project, the uh, Historical Society was closed for my first two years of research, very fortuitously, just in the last two months before I finished uh, the draft of the book, it reopened and I found wonderful, wonderful pictures there. So this uh, opening shot just is kind of an expectant crowd, something exciting is about to happen. And I hope that's how you all are feeling about the talk today. So with that, you probably know uh, this book recently came out from uh, Arcadia Publishing, Images of America series about the Washington Canoe Club. Um, people ask me why I wrote the book. I guess uh, I started looking, I've been a member of the Canoe Club for 30 years. I started looking at old pictures, uh, wonderful historic pictures of the 120 years of history and heard stories from people. Then it occurred to me that this all really needed to be documented. As you'll see in the slideshow, there are things that can happen to old buildings like this and old institutions like this. And uh, I thought it was important to really record what we know at this point and finally, I wrote it because it's just, it was a fun project to do in my retirement. So um, with that, we'll get started. I'm gonna show you an expanded uh, image of this, uh, of this book cover because this kind of frames my talk today and there'll be five parts to my talk. One is about the uh, old Victorian boathouse itself. Secondly, I'll be talking about life along the river bank of the Potomac River. Third, I wanna talk about the craft that we have used and the people who've paddled them. Fourth, I will talk a little bit about the club as a social entity, a social institution. And finally, I wanna talk a little bit about the challenges of a novice historian such as myself putting together a book like this. For example, just in this picture to the right, there are some people sitting on something which is not part of the dock. What are they sitting on? So getting started on the boathouse in 1905, the Washington Post published an article called uh, entitled Paddlers of Canoes. It introduced the founders of the club, all uh, various professionals from around Washington. It had a sketch of what the boathouse would look like. It, it uh, described it as the best equipped 
will be the best equipped on the Potomac uh, River. It described uh, that it would have a handsome, um, handsome smoking lounge and ladies room and that it would have, it would be thoroughly heated, which is not something it is today. The boathouse drew its inspiration from the uh, boathouses on the Charles River in Boston. Our architect, uh, George P. Hales, came from Boston, uh, had moved to Washington, but was very familiar with the vernacular style there, of the late 19th century, wood shingled, uh, gabled boathouses. And that's what he brought to Washington. The club was uh, first built, the uh, uh, first section of it in 1904, 1905, uh, in addition, uh, what came in 1910 when the second tower to the right was added. This is a, just after 1910. One of the interesting things is that the boathouse was actually built out over the water. Only the north end of it perched on the edge of the land and the rest of it um, was built on piers over the water, which had its challenges over, th over the years. Inside is a, a wonderful ballroom with a vaulted ceiling, a huge fireplace, uh, a site of many dances, theatricals, dinners, all kinds of parties there. Uh, also a place where on a cold winter day, the uh, members could sit in, in front of a roaring fire and swap yarns surrounded by the uh, trophies that their uh, paddling compatriots had won over the years. On the first floor is a, a marvelous mural that was done by an early club member by the name of Felix Mahoney it depicts the founding members of the canoe club in various kind of hilarious uh, poses. Um, it's, it is a representation of what the canoe club was then, uh, white, male, uh, and it's been troubling to some of our members because it really doesn't reflect uh, who we are today, but it does have wonderful period pieces. For example, the pianist playing a tune about Roosevelt in Africa. Well, uh, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt went to Africa after his presidency in 1909, a well-publicized trip where he brought back, I don't know, 500 uh, large animals to the Smithsonian collection. And apparently there was a music, uh, piece of music written about that. The um, Canoe Club has been a really uh, pictorial, picturesque fi fixture on the riverbank ever since the uh, it was built, this is in the mid, probably 1915, something like that, with the towers of Georgetown University uh, behind. It's been the subject uh, for an inspiration for many artists, watercolorists, uh, oil painters, um, uh, just uh, sketchers or pen and ink drawers um, of the club over the years uh, as uh, you know, this really striking building right on the riverfront. The, Boathouse is now in pretty dilapidated shape. And I'll talk a little more about that later, but uh, we are, we the club members are no longer allowed to use it. It's considered unsafe for occupancy. The National Park Service, our landlord has been in to stabilize, um, put up uh, bracing and buttresses to um, keep the uh, roof strong and the walls from collapsing. So that's the current condition, but we're still very active um, using the club uh, you can see the roof is in good shape or pretty good shape and, and so on. Uh, this is uh, actually a uh, picture of uh, the uh, DC Preservation League holds an annual uh, fundraiser crab feast at the club uh, each August. And uh, this was in, I think, 1918, uh, Capital Pride was a co-host. The, uh, the finest, recommendation, the highest honor a boathouse can receive though, uh, is depicted here. Look carefully at what this is made out of. It looks like it's made of Lego blocks. And in fact, the pinnacle of architectural achievement is to be included in Legoland in California, along with the White House, the Jefferson and Lincoln Memorials. And here we are in Legoland. So the Washington Canoe Club, uh, as it looks today, uh, is just a um, real landmark on the Georgetown waterfront. The building is on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's um, um, you know destined for a uh, restoration over the next years. We'll talk a little more about that. Second, I wanted to turn to uh, 
Being on the Banks of the Potomac, uh, wonderful book uh, by Fritz Goodheim, was written back in the 40s, part of a series on rivers of America that was kind of a classic series introducing Americans to these, to these rivers. This book has just lyrical descriptions of the uh, Potomac and, uh, and the history of the, what is often called the nation's river. We'll start though in, uh, during the Civil War. This is a picture looking up from Mason's Island now called Roosevelt Island, upriver. You can see the aqueduct bridge in the distance and a wonderful uh, image here of the barge being towed across by cable from the Virginia shore toward Georgetown with the horses and the buggies um, uh, atop the barge. About the same era, 1865, uh, this shot was made of Georgetown looking from the Virginia shore toward DC. The Washington Canoe Club will eventually be dead center at the uh, riverside in this, but on the hill to the left, you see the original buildings of Georgetown University, Old North. Healy Hall has not yet been built. To the right, you see the aqueduct bridge now converted to a, a wagon bridge. You can see the causeway uh, connecting it to Canal Road. You can actually see, if you look carefully, the canal boats in the canal, uh, 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 several of them, you can see the mules uh, tied up. It's a beautifully clear image um, of, of what the riverfront looked like in uh, the mid 19th century. Uh, in the late uh, 1880s, here was um, a view from Leslie's Weekly of the riverfront. Notice now the Healy Hall uh, stands on the hill at Georgetown University. And along the riverfront, there are two large white buildings which turn out to be mills operating off water power from the CNO Canal. A photograph of about the same time again shows the mills, Healy Hall, but you'll notice there's now a railroad track running along the uh, along the bank of the bank of the river. A close up of the of the um, riverfront uh, and the kind of the uh, little settlement that's developed there, uh, and you can see the track running along the riverfront off to the left. The first image of the Washington Canoe Club shows uh, the uh, railroad running in front of the uh, in front of the um, mills and um, apparently behind the uh, uh, Canoe Club. Uh, this probably is 1906. I love the sailing sloop there on the left. Not a very clear picture uh, of that's about uh, 10 years later and uh, mid-teens. I wanted to show it because you can see the array of uh, sheds, bathhouses, boathouses, a rather large structure further upstream. The mills now are gone, but I probably have 30 pictures of the riverfront and every single one of them um, is, uh, shows a different array of buildings and uh, outbuildings and so on. Another view of uh, the riverfront in the foreground and the right, you can see the uh, docks of an adjacent boathouse, Dempsey's Boathouse, which grew to enormous size. Actually, at some point, at one point, was uh, renting as many as 800 canoes. You can also see a barge parked at the canoe club. In the initial picture I showed you where the crowds were sitting, apparently this barge was towed in as a party barge to house the crowds during the, during the um, uh, uh, regatta. Upstream, you can see some more boathouses, cabins. And in fact, the Riverbanks of the Potomac became very important during the summers. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But a, a couple more images of the of the canoe club here with uh, Dempsey's on the to the right uh, and a shed and a, or a boathouse. We can't find any provenance on uh, upstream to the left of the canoe club. Build out in about 1920 of Dempsey's. Uh, the canoe club is on the left. Dempsey's boathouse now stretches. Uh, 100 yards, 300 feet from the uh, aqueduct bridge all the way to the Washington Canoe Club. Dempsey sadly burned down in 1961. It had been there since the whole history of the Washington Canoe Club, 60 years. It was 
a reminder of the threat that the Washington Canoe Club has lived under uh, for its entire history, uh, a wood shingle building that could so easily go up in flames. What the waterfront looked like in 1922 or so, the reason we can date this so accurate is that you can see the old aqueduct bridge uh, with uh, the trolley tracks and to the right, the construction of Key Bridge well underway. And that's what you see um, in 1923 today. The view is still the uh, remnants of the aqueduct bridge, Potomac Boat Club there kind of in the center of the Washington Canoe Club in a relatively isolated position, but one that belies the history of development and buildings along the along the Potomac. I did want to talk for a moment about uh, the aqueduct bridge because it figures in many of our photographs, but it was built originally as a uh, canal uh, connection so that the uh, boats coming down the CNO Canal could traverse the river and go all the way to Alexandria. So Alexandria would remain a viable seaport uh, to take on some of the commerce that was coming into Georgetown. Later, the uh, bridge, the canal part was uh, abandoned and a uh, steel truss was added and it became a wagon bridge. Uh, you can actually see a horse, horse pulling a wagon up there and also then a trolley streetcar connection between the district and uh, Alexandria, or Arlington and Roslyn. Later still, uh, it became a, uh, a automobile bridge as well as pe pedestrian bridge. And then in 19, 20, uh, the key bridge was started. This is a photo from probably, well, between 23 and 33 because the aqueduct bridge was removed in 1933. Another picture of the, um, you can see the development on the shoreline going up from the Washington Canoe Club. The Washington Canoe Club is um, in the lower part of the picture just above the aqueduct bridge, um, but there's lots of development along the shoreline. In fact, there was a reason for this because Washington summers were very hot and what were people uh, to do in the day before air conditioning, residential air conditioning, which really didn't come in until the 50s. Well, they repaired to the riverbank and set up tents, camps of all kinds. Families would come and spend the summer on the riverbank, some quite informally, some more formally uh, as with the colonial, colonial um, club the, uh, they had 16 tents on tent flat platforms and they had a kitchen tent, which doubled as a dance floor. They actually had a Victrola for Saturday night dances. Uh, the, it was quite a social scene uh, along the river in the summers, uh, uh, all kinds of picnics and events going on. The men of the family would go to work though. They would paddle their canoes downstream, park them, uh, get on a, a trolley, streetcar, go to work, come home in the evenings and, and relax. So it was, it was quite a scene all the way up until the 1940s, as far as I can tell. I, this is one of the old pictures, but I love the picture because it in some ways is quite modern. You can see the, uh, the child's face blurred out perhaps because the parents haven't given consent to have the child photographs. And the child also appears to have what is a great Game Boy or a tablet for playing games or maybe a early version of it. But life was not always so tranquil on the river because mother nature had other things in mind. Uh, floods came fairly frequently. Uh, here is one in the 30s in uh, Georgetown uh, inundated, inundating much of the riverfront uh, area uh, where crowds gather. Washington Canoe Club was hit hard uh, again and again. Uh, the club in the background, other uh, railroad sheds and Dempsey's Boathouse clo closer in. We would try to get our boats up out of the way and with floods up into the riverbank. And uh, sometimes we were quite successful at that. You can see the uh, railroad track here running along uh, the, the uh, river, the waterfront uh, uh, with a pedestrian walking. So the water's not as deep here at that point. But there was terrific damage done. M many boathouses were completely taken out by the floods or sometimes major ice jams. The Washington Canoe Club somehow survived all of these, probably for a couple of reasons. One was the uh, post and beam construction, which allowed the uh, water, flood waters to 
flow through the first floor and knock out walls as happened here, but those can be tacked back up. And we also are, have an advantage of being uh, next to kind of a physiographic anomaly, a little point of land that creates an eddy where the club is. So major floods actually flow upstream when they hit the canoe club. But nonetheless, major damage can be done here. You see the canoe goo goo took a hit and people are starting to do the cleanup. But uh, over the years, we just, we get a fire hose, hose out all the mud and be back in, back, back in business. Um, the floods though continue. This is 1972, uh, which along with 1936 of so the two highest floods came all the way into the second floor. And those are courageous individuals standing on the balcony of the club there. 1996, we had two major floods uh, and the floods as I've looked at the records come on roughly a uh, 20 year, a 10 year cycle. So we have not had a big flood in 25 years and uh, we are due and it's of, of great, great concern to us. So I think with uh, that I'm gonna pause for a minute and see if there are any questions. And Melissa, I got a report that, uh, that people are seeing my face too much and the, the screen. Can you check and see if, if people are seeing mostly the screen and my face very small? Um, yeah, let's see. Okay. Somebody, if, I guess if people are having a trouble seeing the full screen, uh, they should get, send that to you in chat. Maybe that's the best thing. Yeah, if everybody, um, if everybody has, or whoever has it in like full screen mode, you probably see a little window with Chris's face. Um, if you want to, um, yeah, so Anne, Anne had put that in the chat too, yeah. So if you're in full screen mode, there should be a little icon in Chris's window that says hide, hide thumbnail video. You can hit that and it would kind of minimize his window and just show you the full screen. Or if you take yourself out of full screen mode, it'll show you his presentation and then like a little video of Chris at top on the top. So um, yeah, so I encourage you to be in full screen mode. Um, Great, yeah. so uh, we got any questions? Let's see, oh, and Andrew said, um, yeah, um, no questions yet, but if anybody has any questions, uh, now is the time you can put those in the Q and A box. Um, Kind of give you all a moment to think about it. If not, there'll be other opportunities. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll pause uh, uh, at least once more as we go through. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mary. Um, so if you're in full screen mode, it's gonna have Chris kind of floating in his in his own little video box in the corner. Um, there's an icon at the top of that. It's like a small little line right in the upper left hand corner. Um, you hit that and then it'll it'll minimize Chris and just show the, the, the presentation. Um, but that's only in full screen mode. Um, and then William asked, what type of canoes were used during the Civil War era? Uh, good question. I will be getting to discussion of craft in a few minutes and I think that will answer that question. Great. Um, and then Anne asked, were those floods in the summer or winter? They generally happen around hurricane time uh, uh, in the fall, but one of them, uh, well, there was a major one I know on Valentine's Day back in 1918. Uh, the, uh, there was one of the 1996 floods was in January. So I don't think we always know. Sometimes it's a spring runoff, snow melt uh, or hurricane season. So they can happen any time of year. So I think we should continue on, Melissa, at this point, we can answer more questions later. Yep, sounds great. Good, good. So swimming has always been a big activity at the Washington Canoe Club, uh, but the Canoe Club is a very competitive place. And so people started imagining what, what could we do to do an exciting uh, swimming race? How about if we do a three mile race from Chain Bridge to the Canoe Club? Now, Chain Bridge is not ordinarily a place you'd think about starting a swimming race. This view from uh, the major flood in 1936 is on the, looking from the Virginia side toward uh, DC. The bridge is the old bridge, it's been replaced, but um, the new bridge is at the same height as this one. So you can get an idea of how, 
high the flood waters were. But nonetheless, the water tends to be lower in the summer. And in 1911, the Canoe Club instituted uh, the, uh, a canoe, a swimming race, three mile swimming race from the chain bridge all the way to Washington Canoe Club. The race was so successful uh, uh, over the years uh, with people coming not just from the Washington area, but from Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, that in 1925, the Canoe Club petitioned President Calvin Coolidge to become the sponsor of the race, which he did graciously. And this was the, uh, this was the program for the first race. And incidentally, it was sanctioned and directed by the Amateur Athletic Union and it's listed as the first long distance team swimming championship in the United States. Uh, it's a really piece of history. So the race started, as I mentioned, at, at Chain Bridge. This, uh, they built a special platform for the starters. This was a confusing picture for me, and this is one of the challenges of doing the book because the, it doesn't make sense. The, Virginia, the DC side, looking up river, the DC side just doesn't look like that. So someone suggested that I flip the picture and would that work better? And in fact, it does work better. That's more like what it looks like on the Virginia side. Uh, although I'm still not satisfied. This is how the picture appears in the book, but the, the buildings upstream still make me question this, but this was listed on the back of the photo that I found as the start of the race. So there you go. This more looks like it swimming down through the gorge there right below. Uh, chain bridge. Uh, obviously, the water level is a lot lower than during the flood and relatively safe, although after five or six years, the race was uh, changed to a triangular course uh, down around Georgetown to make it make it safer. At the end of the race, there were trophies uh, given and the, the race actually became much, part of a much larger President's Cup regatta that included rowing, sailing, um, uh, paddling events, crew, um, and eventually motorboat racing. Uh, and uh, this became a national, a national capital institution for almost half a century. The program from 1960, when I was a child in DC, we used to go and watch these hydroplane races. It was a big deal. And that seems to have continued till 1970. And it's one of the pieces I don't know why it, why it petered out. One of, Turn now to the craft we pa we've paddled and who paddled them. Uh, the, uh, William asked about that. Uh, well into the 19th century, birch bark canoes were really the canoes used by everyone. This is a wonderful picture of a, a Ojibwe family in a birch bark canoe. I, it was a, also an example of um, the challenge of doing the book, finding pictures you really like that you can't use because the resolution is simply too poor. But canoeing had become very popular by the end of the 19th century. And uh, at the same time, manufacturers in Canada, in Maine, began making wooden canvas canoes that were affordable for the emerging middle class. Um, these canoes were wonderful for, uh, for social occasions. They uh, were great for courting. There was an opportunity for uh, young couples to get away from the prying eyes of, of chaperones during the Victorian era. Uh, of course, some men couldn't uh, resist the uh, excitement, the challenge of taking advantage of the situation and um, really uh, violating any kind of decorum. Although this, this picture is a little ambiguous because the woman doesn't look completely unwilling uh, and uninviting of the advances. Canoodling, it was called on the postcard. These postcards came from a friend in Canada, by the way. One of the distinctions I make in the book, because it's a pet peeve of mine, is between rowing and paddling. This is a cruise shell, an eight. They, the rowers face backwards. They use oars, uh, or, uh, or, well, oars in this case, um, or skulls in other cases. Uh, that's very different than paddling, where the, the uh, Paddlers face forward, they use paddles. And uh, I'm always troubled when people say, what, how long an oar do you use? Because uh, paddlers use paddles. Early on, paddling became a very competitive sport uh, at the canoe club, both for men and for women. Miss Elizabeth Smith had been a champion diver. She uh, 
uh, joined the canoe club and she teamed with an Olympian, Harry Knight, to become a, a very outstanding tandem paddling duo. Both single blade and when you first look at this picture, you say, oh, those must be a group of rowers. But if you look carefully, they've got double blade paddles, what we now would call kayak paddles. And so um, uh, canoe racing involved both single and double blade paddling. Come 19, uh, 1924, uh, the Paris Olympics decided to have canoeing as a demonstration sport to see if it would be something that should become part of uh, the Olympic Games into the future. And they selected uh, teams from various countries, Canada, the United States, the entire United States team for this first Olympic demonstration was from the Washington Canoe Club, paddling double blade paddles with uh, they came home with all the gold medals in the double blade and um, a number of other medals as well. So it was a successful debut and uh, paddling has been, became an official Olympic sport in 1936 and has been part of it ever since. Canoeing was of huge interest to, to crowds and spectators, uh, large crowds. Uh, this one looks, looks to be on Haynes Point. Uh, uh, this is actually from a Brooklyn, New York newspaper, 30,000 people showing up for a canoe race. Doesn't happen today, but it was uh, immensely popular uh, in the teens and 20s. We continued uh, competing paddling in the 30s here um, on a, a regatta in New Jersey. Uh, you can see our wooden boats, which were called peanuts, which were our racing boats at that point um, in a way trip. Come 1952, and uh, that's kind of a important date in the history of the Canoe Club um, in terms of the Olympics, which are held in Helsinki. But I'll have to go back to 1924 because the foremost paddler in the country in 1924 was a man named Bill Havens, pictured here with his wife, Ruby. Uh, he was destined to go to the Olympics with that team in 1924, but his wife became pregnant with their second son, Frank Havens, and he decided to stay home from the Olympics. Frank grew in to be a champion paddler along with his brother, Bill Havens, um, won some national championships, went to the Olympics in 1948 and in 1952, uh, went to Helsinki and won the 10,000 meter race uh, in a world record time. This is from a video, so it's a, not a great, great photo. But here's what he wrote home to his father. Dear dad, I had a wonderful time here in Finland competing for the United States. On my way home, I'm on my way home today. The 10,000 meter was a real challenge, let me tell you. The Hungarian, the Czech were ahead of me all the way, but I gave it my all. Pappy, there's something else I want you to know. Thanks for staying home and waiting around for me to be born back in 1924. I'm coming home with the gold medal. You should have won. Your loving son, Frank. A very touching very touching story. We continued to uh, attract uh, competitive paddlers in 1960. Uh, there was kind of a um, major milestone. Glorian Perrier, a French Canadian from Lewiston, Maine, moved to Washington as a softball. Well, she worked for the Defense Department, but she was a big softball player and star in bowling leagues. She was persuaded to come and paddle and started paddling at the canoe club. She was on the first, uh, she became an expert a kayaker and went to the Olympics in 1960. Um, however, uh, uh, just a year later, a 13 year old teenager who had been playing tag on her playground at a junior high school and was encouraged to come down and paddle, um, Francine Fox took up kayaking. And six months later, still as 13 year old, she became the national kayak champion, besting her coach, Glorianne Perrier. Francine, this really cute, um, teenager be, was just became a darling of the media and uh, she was followed around and people, this was a scrapbook page I found where people were tracking Francine. Well, Glorianne, not to be denied, said, well, why don't, why don't I team up with Francine? They became a duo, very strong paddling duo, duo and went to Tokyo and uh, in 1964 and won the silver medal in the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, these, this is, these are only two of the nine medals ever won by American flatwater paddlers, Glorianne and Francine. 
we continue to win championships, um, place people on Olympic teams all through the uh, 70s and 80s. This group, uh, three of the four of them were Olympians. Uh, they nicknamed themselves the Tootsie Rollers in paddling and uh, four, -person, four person kayak. In 1988, the club won its second uh, gold medal, uh, again in, uh, in sprint kayak uh, in the back, Norman Bellingham uh, paired with Greg Barton in the front to win the gold medal at the Seoul, Seoul Olympics. I wanted to talk just for a second about what canoes are, we're, we're still paddling. Aluminum canoes are still popular and good strong. We have old war canoes that date back uh, 70 years uh, that are in use. Uh, sprint canoes that are used in the Olympics. Sprint kayaks uh, for solo tandem and actually they're four, four person kayaks as well. We have Outrigger has become, Hawaiian Outrigger has become very popular both in um, singles, doubles, and also six person teams. Our women's team is probably the class of the whole country. They go to Catalina every year. They go to uh, Hawaii uh, every year for, for racing. Uh, just to give you an idea, Frank Havens, this is the boat that he won the Olympics in, in 1952. Uh, it was called a peanut, all wood frame. Uh, a, you know, fast, comfortable boat. Nowadays, the boats have changed. Uh, uh, new materials and incredibly narrow. In the center in the blue jersey, uh, Ian Ross is in what now is an Olympic paddling canoe. It's 10 inches wide, if you can believe it. And you can see all of the boats in the picture have become narrower as they've gotten to be um, emphasis on more speed. In the background, a stand-up paddleboard, which has become a very popular um, activity at the canoe club. So I think I'll pause there for a second and uh, see if there are any questions. Yeah, so we have a few um, kind of, but Honda wanted to know uh, when it came to like the floodings, um, how long did repairs usually last and, and what was the cost? Um, maybe also for today, like how long will the repair, sorry, how long will the repair be to restore the boathouse and, and what is the cost if you know, um, I guess? Yeah, two, a couple of questions there. Uh, the flooding, typically we're back in business in a few days to a week where we have volunteers who flock down to the club first to move the canoes out of harm's way when there's a flood coming and then come back down, put up walls, clean out the mud and so on. So we're usually back in business after a week and I don't know about the costs of that. I, 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 uh, the building itself has stayed up. So the costs, I think are probably pretty incidental. In terms of the overall plan for the building rehabilitation, that's gonna be a long-term project. Uh, we, ex we hope to embark on phase one in the next couple of years. We've got the um, concept designs from an architect. We're actually meeting this Thursday with the uh, staff of the, uh, of the DC, uh, uh, State Historic Preservation Officer and others to do a pre first presentation of, of uh, our plans. The, uh, but the costs are gonna be very large to really fully restore to the building to its former grandeur. The, we're expecting the first phase probably to cost a million and a half dollars and uh, they'll go up from there to uh, probably at least $5 million. We've had some estimates. Wow. Um, well, just as a reminder, everybody, if you purchase Chris's book, some of those proceeds go to that effort. So keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, so John wanted to know, um, did the Potomac floods ever get so bad that in the past there was serious thought given to placing dams up river? Wow. <laughs> I, don't I, know don't, I don't, I know the answer partially to that. The Corps of Engineers had a major dam proposal back in around 1930, where they were gonna build a large dam at right, ab right at Little Falls, right above Chain Bridge, which was gonna create a lake all the way back to Great Falls. Uh, then I believe there was, a part of that project was also to create a dam above Great Falls that would uh, create a, another huge lake. But these were primarily for water supply, as I understand it. I don't think they were, the main uh, reason was flood control, but I'm not really sure about that. Potomac is unusual, really unique in the Eastern United States for not having any large dams. It's got 
feeder dams for the Siena Canal. It's got one, one water supply, emergency water supply dam way up near the headwaters in Bloomington, Maryland, but it's really unusual for not having large flood control dams. Um, and I guess kind of like in the same vein as that, I don't know if you found this in, in your research or in kind of like the current state of like the club today, but um, Jeannie asked, uh, did water pollution in the river come to be a problem? Um, have you all found that to be a problem at all? That, uh, not for the canoe club, curiously enough. The, you know, the water quality uh, got worse and worse over the first 60 or 70 years of the 20th century, uh, as there was more upstream development, as Washington grew, as the combined sewers dumped into the Potomac. Uh, the Canoe Club continued its activities, as far as I can tell, uninterrupted. I've been told by people who were around in the 50s and 60s that even at that point, when the river was considered and uh, listed in the Washington Post as an open sewer, we continued swimming and using it. And then since 1970, with the passage of the Clean Water Act, the river has gotten much cleaner and uh, it's routinely swum in now. And um, we, we don't know of any cases where people got sick. Great. Um, somebody else asked, uh, was the Washington Canoe Club open to women when it opened in 1905? Was it open to people of color when it was established? Uh, no and no. The... I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, but the uh, social clubs at that point tended to be both uh, gender male only and uh, segregated. And, uh, and so uh, the women, while they were active in paddlers and winning, <laughs> winning medals, didn't actually become, weren't allowed to become full members until 1969, which is really late in the process. It's odd, odd because they were so much accepted as, as members and, 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 and paddlers, uh, competitors. Um, in terms of segregation, um, the club didn't do well in that and never has. It's partly a reflection of being the city, but uh, we still are not, not uh, very diverse. We've got uh, Islanders, we've got uh, Indians, Pakistanis, we've got a number of other uh, people from other parts of the country, but we have only a very small uh, membership of uh, African Americans. So, Melissa, maybe we should move on at this point, and then we'll have time for more questions at the end. Sounds great. Okay. So, talking about the club as a social entity, back in the late 19th century, um, there began to be uh, various social organizations, or, uh, fraternal fraternal groups that came together. And as I mentioned, um, men only and white only. I, I believe that the African-American community had similar organizations, um, but this one, uh, the Canoe Club came out of the tradition of, of basically white only. This is a great picture because you can see three little boys perched in there learning, learning what it is, I guess, to be a part of one of these clubs. And along with the uh, or, uh, these organizations, which were for really for social as well as uh, athletic and activities, there was a huge uh, movement, physical culture movement. And part of the original mission statement of the Washington Canoe Club was to improve physical culture. Um, this really, we might call this today health and wellness, but there were exercise programs and various ways for people to take care of their bodies. Uh, and awareness really for the first time as more and more people were living in cities. This happens to be a shot of the Washington Canoe Club wrestling team back in the uh, uh, around 1920, I believe. So the Canoe Club uh, came out of this tradition of, 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 of um, social fraternal organizations uh, focused on athletic activity. Lots of women, but women were not, were not members. One woman who <laughs> kind of played in a uh, role at the club though was uh, Maisie Havens, who was a matriarch of a large five generation, now five generation family at the club. Um, her, her family hung out um, on the Potomac in the summers. They built this, this uh, tar paper shack called Camp Tut and uh, spent their summers there learning to paddle and socializing. Um, their, uh, her grandson, uh, uh, Frank Havens became an Olympic champion. Both of her sons were Olympians. 
And now there are two more generations, Frank in the middle, his son, Dan on the right, and his, uh, uh, his son, Sean on the left. So this is a family that arrived at the Canoe Club in 1918 and has been there ever since. And it really is part of the glue that holds the, the, the club together. The, uh, as I mentioned, uh, swimming competitions and all kinds of competitions were always have been very important to the club. Not only did we have uh, paddling and swimming and sailing teams, but also football, we had boxing, we had bowling teams, water polo. We even had a track team and uh, that competed and they actually went to the uh, Penn Relays. And when I look at back at these records and who these people were, I wonder how the men ever even had time to go to work really. Women were not to be left out, a, sw uh, a women's swimming team. This is a funny picture to me because it looks very modern, including the building behind it. But uh, I'm certain because of identification of one of the people in it that it's from the 1920s, women's swim team. And women have continued to ha have strong social bonds. And, and this is our uh, current uh, uh, women's outrigger team uh, on a trip to Hawaii. So this, the teams have been a very much part of what have kept the club together, as well as uh, our volunteer uh, spirit, uh, taking care of the club, doing repairs, painting, and so on, sometimes doing really major work on foundations um, of the club under the building. It's been a place, but of course, for uh, families, for fun, uh, wintertime skating. This is uh, sadly a scene we don't see as much anymore. Uh, in the background of this picture, you can see the car barn in Georgetown as well as, as, well as Key Bridge. Uh, summertime, all kinds of uh, activities went on. Uh, including very relaxing times on, on, on the docks uh, uh, in the summer. The club has been a great place for kids uh, to get accustomed to being in boats, to be comfortable with the water, to learn paddling skills. Uh, we actually have had uh, juniors programs, youth programs to train the next generation of competitors. And that's been very active. We had, we've had good coaches and we have uh, probably at any given time, uh, 15 to 30, uh, kids from age 10 to 18 in, in, engaged in our uh, junior training programs. The club has had lots of social activities, dances, it's a, actually a stage in the ballroom for a band of theatricals, New Year's Eve parties, uh, uh, you know, very social place. In the uh, summers, we have uh, crab feasts a couple times a summer. In the winter, uh, we have oyster roasts, uh, uh, just to keep things going. And these are traditions that have lasted for, for 100 years. We also have events, uh, General Clinton Regatta in Cooperstown, New York, uh, every spring where about 50 club members go up and um, are uh, together. And it's really, it's kind of a um, strong esprit de corps within the paddlers of the club. We also have an important role, I think in the District of Columbia. Um, first is uh, first responders when there are tip overs, when there are boating accidents, the canoe club members are often on the river or see them and can get there quickly well before the Harbor Police or emergency uh, rescue squads here, uh, bringing a chilly paddler uh, out of the river whose teeth are chattering, uh, sometimes even more life-threatening situations. Uh, you can see the remnants of these guys' canoes, uh, canoe here. So this is a very important, and most of us, I'd say most of us who've been at the club for some time have participated in, in rescues. Many people have stories of saving lives. We also have programs to bring more diverse um, youth into paddling. Uh, several groups we uh, sponsor every year to come and spend a day paddling and learning skills and just enjoying being near the river. And uh, this is a part of our uh, effort to be more diverse and also to, to serve the city. The club has been a destination for long, uh, long distance voyages for years and years uh, from around the United States. This is a brigade that paddled in from Ottawa, Canada, CAP, the CAP to CAP group to uh, publicize water quality issues uh, in Canada and the United States. In, in 2016, the Hokulea, a sailing canoe uh, from Hawaii arrived having sailed well over 10,000 miles uh, through the Indian Ocean around Cape of, uh, Cape of Good Hope, um, up through the Atlantic uh, and, and into Washington, um, 
we were they were greeted at the canoe club by the Polynesian Voyager Society um, with dancing, with with music, with conch shell horns blowing. The Secretary of the Interior was there to help greet them, and the Hokulea was docked at the canoe club for ten days. Uh, about a thousand people, students, school children, and others came to view it to learn about what it was like to be on the open ocean in a craft like this with uh, only 13 other crew members, no uh, uh, mechanical navigation equipment, just using traditional Polynesian celestial navigation. Um, it was a you know wonderful educational experience for, for, for all of us. The Canoe Club also hosts each year the um, a group of wounded warriors through a wonderful partner, uh, uh, Team River Runner. These guys come down, guys and gals come down and uh, uh, learn how to paddle. And it's a tremendously therapeutic um, activity for them, uh, really renewing. We get testimonials of how important this is. We hold a biathlon. Uh, these kayaks are uh, special adaptive kayaks for, for, for the, the, these folks. And it's, it's a, a, a very, you know, I think a very worthwhile thing we do for the community. We haven't had a lot of celebrities in our history. Um, it's interesting, um, one kind of celebrity on the far left here is Grant Conway, who walked the uh, entire length of the CNO Canal with Justice William O. Douglas in 1904. Douglas is in the picture fourth from the right, uh, which was the beginning of the uh, preservation effort that uh, came to an end with the um, or eventually ended with the designation of the CNO Canal as a National Historical Park. Uh, but we, ha we haven't really had a lot. Um, one uh, uh, story that I'm gonna have to share another day is the day that Elvis Presley came to the Canoe Club. But we have other great traditions. Um, the uh, Watergate concerts, which took place from, gee, I think the mid thirties, almost to 1970, where People would come down, the National Symphony Orchestra was on a barge on the far left there. People would flood the steps there uh, in front of the Lincoln Memorial. The, uh, our folks and others would paddle down in the canoes and listen, listen to these concerts and have an evening of social ability, cuddling. It was a, one of the great traditions uh, of the Potomac. Another one that exists to this day is going down to watch my canoe, going down to watch the 4th of July fireworks and uh, that's something um, that uh, hopefully will continue well into the future. So this is the club uh, picture from 1940. I love this picture because there's a police boat in it. And I'm sort of curious what the police are doing at the club, but it was in the National Geographic. I couldn't get permission to use it in the, in the book. So this is the club, but this is also the club, but this is rendered by a unknown artist. I found this in someone's uh, scrapbook, but uh, this, child obviously uh, had picked up the uh, magic and the mystery and the magnificence of the of the Washington Canoe Club. So the last part I want to just talk about the challenges of a novice doing history. Um, so first mystery, here's the rail line which I showed you earlier running along the river. Well we all know that there was a rail line running along the river because there's now a rail trail there, and some of you remember the Georgetown branch. So here's the rail line. And here's another picture of it on the trestle, 4,000 4, feet of trestle out along the river. Um, and apparently it's not finished because you can see the gentleman perched on the edge of it. So there's still some work to be done. The first picture of the canoe club, which I showed you before, you, sh you see the rail line running in front of the mills and behind, well, is it behind the, doesn't make any sense that, that it's behind the canoe club. It's confusing. And I spent a lot of time and finally got the help of a wonderful railroad historian, um, Ben Sullivan, to help me solve this mystery. Um, because when you look carefully at this picture, the canoe club is not in front of the rail line. It's not behind it. It's in the middle of it. And in fact, this rail line was never completed. It was started in the 1890s. and. Um, uh, the track was never laid down. This is uh, a picture as it he was heading into Georgetown under the Aqueduct Bridge Arch, but no track was laid down and the actually was never finished. And when the canoe club was built, as far as I can tell, they just took down the part of the trestle that was bothering <laughs> in the way and probably even used some of the timbers from it to build the Washington Canoe Club. 
But soon thereafter, the, um, the uh, b &O Railroad decided they would finish a railroad into Georgetown. And they, um, so they began working on the Georgetown branch. I meant to note here that one of the obstacles to running the railroad in was that the arch under the old aqueduct bridge is too low for a locomotive. But the b &O Railroad undertook to raise the level of the arch, huge enterprise because there was still an active trolley line and, and, and uh, uh, automobile uh, road above there. So they had to do a huge amount of uh, structural work to actually raise, raise the arch, but they succeeded and here was the arch and this is the way it looks today, much larger so it could accommodate a locomotive and then actually begin serving Georgetown. The, this was the first picture I found of a train actually on the track. It was from right in 1910. And I know that because the canoe club only has, and this is trying to date these pictures sometimes, the canoe club only has one turret. The second turret was added in 1910. So this is a photograph right in either 1909 or 1910 with the train actually backing in with supplies for the railroad and the canoe club yet to have its, its second tower. Trains kept running uh, for uh, 70 years uh, through thick and thin, through floods. This photo shows that we all, the club was not always organized enough to get its canoes out of the harm's way during floods. And I don't know whether the train <laughs> may actually hit some of our, our canoes in the picture. 1947, a freight train uh, coming down the Georgetown branch. And then in 1985, uh, the, the, there was an official abandonment. The, the ownership of the right of way changed hands a couple of times, but eventually ended up with the National Park Service. And we now have the Capitol Crescent Trail running along that old rail line. But that was one of the mysteries I had to solve early on. Uh, a second one, um, I mentioned that Frank Havens had won the uh, gold medal in 1952. Here he is with his wife, Kay, with the medal. Um, so I wanted to say a little more about that in the book. So I got this picture, which the Havens family provided me with, of a luncheon that President Eisenhower hosted uh, in 1952 for America's 44 greatest athletes. So there are a number of Olympians, boxers, track stars there, um, some Hall of Fame famers to the right of, uh, left of President Eisenhower. And on the right, you'll see two pretty well-known athletes, Joe DiMaggio and Rocky Marciano. So, uh, so I said, great. This is, this is gonna be a great photo for the book. But Frank Havens, our gold medalist is not in the picture. What do I do? Well, I contacted the uh, Eisenhower Presidential Library in Abilene, Kansas, and they were absolutely wonderful, did research for me, and they came up with a picture. And on the far left, in the white uh, light suit and the white bucks is our Olympian, Frank Havens at the luncheon. Great, but where's Joe DiMaggio? He stepped out of the picture. Well, with modern technology, you can fix that. Uh, so here's the picture with Joe DiMaggio in the picture in the upper left of the picture. Now you see our own Frank Haven. So all set, but there are ethical issues and can't do it. So the picture that appears in the book uh, is, is the one with Frank Havens in it. And, I'm sorry, Joe DiMaggio just missed out on his, his 15 minutes of fame, I guess. One other example of, of uh, challenges, uh, this is a picture of a uh, kind of a fun race uh, in the mid, uh, about 1922, stand up paddle race. Uh, you can see the women in the background with uh, parasols sitting out in the canoe watching a, a lad perched up on a high diving board that doesn't exist any longer. All the men are clad in their uh, jerseys because in those days, men were not allowed to have bare chests. But the puzzle in this picture was, what is that tower on the far right? Um, is that an oil derrick? Is it a, uh, is it a um, you know, amusement park ride, a, uh, a roller coaster or something? And I puzzled over it for a while. And then I looked carefully and you can see in the background beyond the aqueduct bridge is chain, uh, is, uh, key bridge being constructed. And uh, you can see some of the equipment and I realized that this tower, and I, this, I also looked at some other pictures, this tower was a tower 
uh, that was holding a cable used for the construction. And you can see very lightly in the upper left of the corner, you can actually see, I believe, the cable for that. Another mystery solved, but many, many that I was unable to solve. So I just wanted to end with one story, uh, again from 1952. Um, Ruth the Forest was a paddler from New York who came to the canoe club uh, to uh, paddle. She became a very good paddler. Um, one of the frustrations was that Ruth, uh, there were no good pictures of her, even from Ruth herself of her paddling. But um, she came, she trained, uh, she trained with our gold medal winner, Frank Havens. She became the best women kayaker in the country. Um, so she, she was the first woman to qualify for the US Olympic team. But Ruth was not allowed to go. And there are various reasons and stories that are given for that. Uh, the canoe club advocated very strongly for her to go, but the governing body of sports said, well, she needs a chaperone or there's not money. And she was not permitted to go uh, to the Olympic games. So Ruth uh, left Washington, moved to California, raised a family um, and uh, became a champion in golf and tennis. Uh, Years later, Frank Havens kept racing. Uh, well, he raced for 70 years of his life. In 1998, he called up Ruth and said, Ruth, the World Masters Games are taking place in Washington State. We're going to go. And uh, Ruth took a plank, put it over her swimming pool, and started paddling and training for this event. And uh, they went to the World Masters Games, and they won eight medals between them. So it was a wonderful ending to what had been a very sad story. Here's here them uh, years later when Frank was giving Ruth his participation medal. So that's that's kind of it. That's the book uh, uh, that I wrote. Uh, there are lots of stories uh, in it that I was unable to tell. There are lots of stories uh, uh, that uh, I hope will be told by future historians. Uh, there was just a lot I had to had to pass on. As Melissa mentioned, all the profits, all the royalties from this book will be going to the rehabilitation of the Canoe, canoe Club. Um, so we do have it now a 60 year lease with the Park Service. Um, we have a chance to preserve this remarkable uh, building, uh, one that has really enriched the lives of all its members, including me, and has you know, allowed us to enjoy all the benefits of being um, beside and in and on the Potomac River. So thank you. Thank you, Chris, that was amazing. Uh, all those pictures are so wonderful to see and all the stories. And it's just nice to see, you know, this historical building, like even today, what it's uh, kind of significance is to the current community and, and to the uh, current club members and it's really wonderful place. And um, yeah, if you guys ever have a chance to like go to our crab feast or any of the other events that you guys are holding, I highly encourage you guys to, to go and, and, and visit. It's a really wonderful, wonderful site. Um, and everybody at the club is so wonderful. Um, so More we questions? have a few questions. Yes, okay. we have a few yeah. questions. Okay. Um, yeah. So Anne has two questions. One is, um, if you know this, uh, how deep is the river at the point where the boathouse is and are any of the uh, pendiment remains of the old aqueduct still there below water level? And she said, thank you and awesome talk. I don't know how deep the river is. I, I, uh, I, uh, I really don't know. I, I, 20 feet, 50 feet, I don't know that. The mm -hmm. aqueduct bridge uh, uh, was uh, taken down in 1933 and then the pillars for it were demolished, I think in 19, 61, except for one near the Virginia shore. As I remember, the, they were blown up by the Corps of Engineers, but probably, but down to some level, probably 15 or 20 feet below the river level. So there, I, I think it's very likely the original foundations for them are still there. Um, and then another question she had was, um, since the main building is closed now, were there, uh, where are the main club offices and records housed these days? Mm. Well, the, the club is a very informal affair. For years and years, the records were kept in cardboard boxes and e with each inundation, they became less useful to us as they turned to mulch. Uh, the, uh, 
the records uh, such as they are, are stored right now in various people's homes, uh, as are all our, our silver trophies. And uh, the club didn't really ever have offices. Uh, I should add that the club is going gangbusters. Uh, we have the highest membership we've ever had. I think the pandemic has had something to do with that. People see the opportunity to get to a place where they can um, spend time uh, to paddle, enjoy the water and picnic. Um, and then somebody else asked, uh, when it comes to the Potomac River, do you know of any times in its uh, history where it caught fire, like the uh, river in Cleveland during a period of like heavy pollution? And did that ever affect the boathouse? Yeah, the Kaya, that's a, sort of a seminal moment in the environmental movement when the 19, I think it was 1971, the Cuyahoga River caught fire. I think I would know that if that had ever happened on the Potomac. I don't the Cuyahoga River is a very different situation because it, it's uh, heavily, uh, the riverbank is heavily lined with uh, petrochemical plants and other factories. The Potomac has never had that industrialization for a couple of reasons. So um, we just have never had that level of pollution. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Waiting to see. I guess not. Um, well, again, everybody, if you have questions that you think of after the fact, please feel free to email them to us and, and we can see about um, getting Chris those questions. Uh, well, William did ask, um, I guess about specifically like canoes during the Civil War. Oh, I think. Yeah, I didn't, yeah, William, sorry. I didn't fully answer that. Um, as best as I can tell, and I'm nowhere near a uh, historian of uh, history of canoes, um, birch bark canoes were still the primary use until the 1870s, 1880s. Uh, I think in probably in the 1870s is when they really began to make wooden canvas canoes and old wood, wood canoes. But I don't know of any particular history of what was used in, in terms of canoes. There were obviously lots of other boats used during the Civil War times. Okay, I don't think we have any other questions at this moment. Um, so just so everybody knows, I'm going to put the, I put the link already to the Washington Canoe Club website where you can find more about uh, book details and purchasing options and, and donate to them. Um, I'm gonna put it again in the, in the chat just so it's everybody, everybody sees it there um, along with a couple of other links to BCPL stuff, including our YouTube channel, uh, cause we did record this talk and we're gonna have it on our YouTube channel and uh, Chris, I'll send this to you and you could put this where you would like um, as well. Um, and I would just like to say first, uh, congratulations, congratulations again, Chris, for your book. Um, I'm very excited about it. I am going to go get my own copy um, and I'm excited to read it and see more of these amazing photos. Um, and I encourage everybody again, if, if you're interested, please do get your own copy. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us today uh, to learn more about Chris's work and, and the Canoe Club. Um, and I hope that you all uh, will join us again soon for other DCPL programs and keep up to date on any other talks that Chris is giving. Um, I know you're giving a couple of more, Chris, right, in the future. Yeah. Um, so hopefully you, you all tune into those as well. Um, again, if you have any other questions, uh, please email them to us at info at dcpreservation.org. Um, and thank you again, Chris, for taking the time to talk to us about your work. And my pleasure. You... Thanks. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, it was great. Um, and I hope you all have uh, happy and safe holidays and that we see you soon. Thanks.